So it is my pleasure to have him speak with us and start writing questions down. He can answer many of them or all of them. And uh, enjoy the ride because this is a great, great speaker. Thank you. Thanks very much. So I am Jean-Pierre Perrins. I wrote a book called Kitchen Sink Farming, How to Cheaply and Easily Grow and Ferment Your Own Food for a Healthier Now and a Greener Future. And Laura asked me to come in and speak with you guys about some of the concepts from that book. Um, I welcome all your questions. I'm going to have intervals throughout the talk to be able to get to those. So like she said, write them down, remember them. If you are thinking of a question, probably somebody else is too. So you're going to do a favor to everybody by asking them. I can go really fast and cover things really quickly. So if anything is not clear, please let me know so we can clear it up. If I don't get to your question, email me, jp at kitchensinkfarming.org. This is also, it's on the third page of your handout. It's also the name of my blog, kitchensinkfarming.org, where I have recipes and health information and stuff like that. So be sure to check that out, okay? So I came to talk to you about a really simple thing today, which is seeds. Um, these are sesame seeds. And um, seeds are a really powerful storehouse of nutrition, vitality, and energy that we, if we understand a little bit about how seeds work from a biological um, perspective, we can unlock that and create really vibrant, incredible health every day of our lives, okay? So this is sesame seeds. What other seeds do people eat like on a regular basis in this room? Sunflower, word. Yeah. Pumpkin, nice. Yeah. yeah. Any other ideas? Sesame. Sesame. Ooh, right. These are mine, though. You can't have them. No. Okay, so um, seeds are whole foods, right? They are protecting the nutrients inside. They've got the shell around them. They've got different ways to, to hang on to those nutrients. Because when they grow on a plant, they're not thinking, well, I'm going to be great on some McDonald's hamburger someday. They're thinking, I want to grow up and to become a, a big plant and make seeds of my own, you know, like we all do. So they have um, special ways to protect themselves. The shell is one of them. They also have something called enzyme inhibitors that stop any kind of enzymatic action, any kind of biological activity happening before it's ready, which is when they germinate and sprout, ready to become a plant, right? Um, so... They're a whole food. They're complete, they're protected, they're organic, hopefully. The other end of the spectrum would be, for example, the fast food hamburger that I mentioned. Can anybody tell me how, like what seeds became a fast food hamburger? How something went from a seed to one of the ingredients in a hamburger? Grain. Grain, yeah. Bread. For the bun, yeah, absolutely. Grains, wheat, totally. Pickles, yeah, cucumber seeds become a cucumber, then they get pickled, then they go on to the burger. What else? Mustard seeds. Mustard seeds, awesome. Yeah, totally. A couple processes in that as well. Yeah, we've got tomatoes, we've got lettuce, we've even got the seeds of what the, the cow ate before it became meat, before it became a burger, right? So... With all these things, we have a seed, and then we have multiple steps between that seed and it being the burger that you're eating, okay? You said grains. Um, so wheat is a kind of a similar thing as the, as the seeds that I were talking about in that it has all kinds of nutrients locked up inside, and it's got a protection around the outside, the shell of the, of the wheat, right? A lot of grains have a lot of fantastic oil-soluble, fat-soluble vitamins, like A, like D, like E. And when the grain gets broken up and milled into wheat, all of these nutrients get exposed to the air, get exposed to the light. Okay? It's a problem. They go rancid really quickly. They get attacked by bacteria because they're no longer protected, and they start to go bad. We can't tell if they're bad by looking at them, by smelling them, by tasting them, but they're bad. We can only tell from kind of sophisticated laboratory tests. So unless McDonald's is getting their seeds, their, their, their flowers, from freshly milled organic local organic co-ops, then you can be pretty much guaranteed that those that those grains are going to be rancid. Not only that, but then they do a whole bunch of other stuff. They bake it, they toast it, and, and every one of these steps takes energy away from this original seed and takes it away from you. What's the point of, of eating? What do you guys think? <laughs> kind of a basic question. Sustenance. Sustenance. 
Maybe. I disagree. Who else? Pleasure. Okay, I very much disagree with that one. Anyone have any other thoughts about survival. why I eat? Survival. Again, back to the sustenance. That's true. It can be true. But I kind of see it in a different way, right? Like, we have a chance to eat a meal. We can eat emotionally to feed ourselves. Like, Maybe lasagna makes us feel less alone in our lives, so we choose to eat lasagna, you know, kind of like gumming ourselves up with wheat, with, with meat, with dairy. Or we can survive, like I just want to get through today. Or what, what I generally ask is how can I be filled with the most incredible vitality, not just the absence of disease, but the incredible confidence, life force, and joy that can come from food and can sustain me every single day of my life, you know? way beyond the absence of disease, but vitality and life force and and power, personal power. That's what can come from food. So we eat food, we put a certain amount of energy into digesting it, right? Then we get some energy back from that food after we've digested it. I think that the best plan is to put out the least amount of energy in digesting and get the most amount of energy back, right? That's a good deal. If you're going to invest something, someone's like, hey, give me a hundred bucks and I'll give you 50 bucks back after six months. You're like, man, not so good of a deal. But they're like, give me five bucks and I'll give you a thousand bucks in a couple of days. You say, heck yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want too when I eat. Okay. So we talked about pickles. We talked about bless you, tomatoes, lettuce, and, uh, and all the other seeds that are, that are in this fast food hamburger. Every time something happens to them, it takes nutrients away. Not growing from the seed, obviously, but all these vegetables that are used are genetically modified. It's not seed selecting like they did in the past to find the, you know, the healthiest, the most beautiful, the most flavorful. They take the DNA in the laboratory, they unravel it, they mix it with other DNA. Like in the tomato I mentioned, they add fish DNA to it. This makes it last longer. In the lettuce DNA, they add viruses to it. They add human DNA, okay? None of this time is ever to make this more nutritious taste better even, it's always to make it last longer, like more shelf stable so that it can not go bad, right? It makes it bigger and it makes it cheaper. Now, tell me, is McDonald's and Burger King and Wendy's, are they going to their local organic co-ops and getting fresh from the farmer tomatoes and lettuce? No, they're getting the cheapest stuff that they can get that lasts the longest yeah, that stays fresh, it stays crispy, but really it has very little nutrients in it. And then they cook the stuff and they freeze it and then they reheat it, then they freeze it again, then they fry it. Every single time it's taking energy away from, from this, okay? And it's also an expensive process, expensive financially, expensive to the environment, and expensive to our bodies. So I'm going to show you, after depressing you, I can see everybody's face, they're like, yeah. I'm going to show you how to get the most amount of vitality from these little seeds so that, I can, so that we can create this kind of physiology, this kind of this health, this vitality that we're talking about, okay? So you take some seeds, you put them in a jar, glass, your hand if you have enough time, I suppose, the crook of a tree, it doesn't matter. You pour some water in there. What I like to use to make it really easy, this is a super high-tech sprouting device. I've got a canning jar. I've got a fiberglass piece of window screen. This cost about a nickel from a hardware store. Put it on top and take the ring from the jar and screw it on the top. And you're done. You can also use a rubber band or whatever you want. Fill this up with water and then let it sit for about eight hours. This makes the seed think that it's going to germinate, that it's underneath the, the dirt, that it's going to become a big plant. You know, it gets all excited, and it starts to germinate, right? Then after eight hours, you dump the water out, it comes out of the screen, and then you let it drain, just dry, so that it can get the air, gets the nutrients from the water, gets the nutrients from the air, okay? After about eight more hours, it's sprouted. You can keep sprouting it if you want, and it'll grow a little tail, just like this, if you can all see that. It's a little root. I'll pass this around. This is a garbanzo bean. I've got some 
some sunflower seeds in here as well. So take a look at that and see what happens when you soak it in water and then you let some air get to it. It's a seed. It's a biological machine that is meant to become a big plant. So when we can tap into that nature of the seed, we can use those aspects to make us healthier. Okay? So we now have sprouted sesame seeds. We've soaked them for eight hours. We've drained them. We've let them sit for eight hours. Then if you want, you can, you can rinse and drain them a couple times a day. It takes maybe 15 seconds total. It's after you have made your high-tech device, that is. And um, the difference is amazing. Let's talk about what happens when you sprout a seed. We talked about enzyme inhibitors before, right? Let's talk about that a little bit longer. Enzyme inhibitors are natural protection that the seed has to make sure inhib that the seed has in case it is not ready to, to sprout. So say the seed comes off of a tree or a plant or whatever, it lands on a rock. The sun is going to bake it for a few years before it can find a little dirt to get into. It doesn't want to sprout when it's on the rock because there's no protection, there's no dirt, there's no nutrients, you know? So it has enzyme inhibitors. The way this affects us is that it binds nutrients in our, in our digestive system. They're also called anti-nutrients because they bind iron, they bind phosphorus, they bind calcium and magnesium. They actually take them out of our digestive system. They, they take these nutrients out of rotation, okay? So eating an unsprouted seed is going to take these things out of your system. It's going to make less calcium available, less phosphorus available, etc. Okay? When you soak the seed, the water's going to become kind of cloudy, kind of bubbly. Something's happening, you know? It's like a laboratory in there. And the enzyme inhibitors are getting deactivated. So you can really get into all those nutrients. It's not taking anything out. Okay? This is really important, I think. Number two. You are... Activating enzymes. Does anybody know what an enzyme is? We talked a little bit about enzyme inhibitors. Can anyone extrapolate from that part of the conversation what an enzyme is? Doesn't it help break down, break things down? It does help break things down. Excellent. Any other ideas? I can see the hamster wheels turning. No? Yes? It's a protein that either build something up or kind of take some apart. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, they are, um, they are catalysts. They make change happen. Any kind of change that happens in the body or in any kind of biological system is the result of enzymes. Some, sometimes people ask if they're alive because they kind of seem like they're alive because they, you know, they get in stuff, they make changes, etc. but they're not alive. They're just little biochemical machines. And they are amazing machines. I love enzymes. There's three different kinds. There is... Uh, digestive enzymes, there's food enzymes, and there's metabolic enzymes. Digestive enzymes are enzymes that we make. We eat food that doesn't have any enzymes in it, so our spleen, our pancreas, different places in our body create enzymes to be able to go in and break it down, like you said, so that we can use it. There's complex carbohydrates, turn them into sugars so that we can use them. Proteins, break them down, turn them into amino acids so they can go into the liver and get formed into what we need them to be, right? Does anybody have the experience of eating a big heavy meal and then feeling tired afterwards? Yeah, a couple of you. The reason is, is because your body is like, wow, this is a lot of stuff I got to deal with. I don't want to, you know, I don't want it to become like impacted waste. I don't want to, uh, it to like gum up my system. So I'm going to take all the energy out of all the other body process and go into making enzymes, go into digesting this stuff. So if you eat food that's full of enzymes, you don't get tired after you eat it. In fact, it gives you energy, okay? And moving on. Food enzymes are, food, are enzymes that are available in the food. Sprouts, for example, are full of enzymes. If we cook food, it breaks the enzymes down. It denatures them after about 110 degrees. So they're not there for our, our use anymore. So when we eat foods, we have to supply them. So enzymes that are in food break that food down. 
If there are extra enzymes, like I mentioned sprouts, sometimes have 20 times more enzymes than you need to digest them, then they can go into breaking up all the other food that's in the body. Okay? So you eat a little bit of sprouts on a sandwich with some bread, that kind of thing. The enzymes in those sprouts will go into the bread and help break it down. You won't get tired afterwards like you would have if you hadn't eaten those sprouts or other living foods. Number three, metabolic enzymes. These are my favorite kind of enzymes. These are the enzymes that go through the body and make all the changes. They heal cuts, they grow hair, they grow skin, they cleanse the organs. Okay? But what's really, really cool is that you eat food enzymes. You have extra that you haven't used to digest the rest of your food, right? So then it goes to digest the rest of your food. But you have extra after that if you eat enough enzymes, if you eat enough living food. So then the enzymes can be converted by the body into metabolic enzymes. So these enzymes that are making this bright and fresh and, and clean right here, these will heal cuts. These will cleanse the body's organs, preventing cancer, preventing heart and lung disease, growing hair, helping you think of a cool Halloween costume. Uh, everything that's going on in the body can be facilitated by what's going on right in here. Okay? Very exciting. So, we've made sprouts out of the sesame seeds. We've added them to our foods so that we can utilize all those enzymes. Number three reason to sprout things is it increases nutrients. We talked about how enzyme inhibitors take away nutrients. Well, by doing the exact same thing that takes anti-nutrients out of the food, we're adding nutrients to the food. The plant, the seed, wants to become a plant. That's its purpose, right? So when it goes from being a little seed to a plant, it gets some of the nutrients out of the dirt. It gets a lot of the nutrients out of the water. It gets a lot of the nutrients out of the air. Okay? So, the way that it does that is by taking those little minerals out of the water, you know, like all those little trace minerals that are in water that make it taste good, and converting it into things. When it does that, it activates its own nutrients to be able to grow, to be able to, you know, become... Uh, to change and to grow bark, grow leaves, grow roots, etc. So, if we are going to eat a sprout right as all these nutrients are blossoming, right as all these enzymes are becoming available, we're going to be able to get as much power out of that little seed as possible. If we just eat it by itself, we, you know, without sprouting it, we're not going to get all these benefits, okay? And when I'm talking about nutrients going up, Sometimes we're talking about a 5 to 10% increase. Sometimes we're talking about a 20 to 100% increase. Sometimes we're talking about a 5,000 to a 10,000% increase in certain seeds and certain nutrients. 10,000 times more available when it's sprouted. And back to the reason that we eat. To create incredible, vibrant health and vitality every moment. This is how you do it by increasing the nutrients in the food that you're eating, and by cutting down on the, the energy that you need to put into digesting those things, right? It's a really good investment. A buck here, 10,000 bucks back in just a little bit of time, okay? Does anybody have any questions about the stuff we've covered so far? Yes? Once they're sprouted, how long do they keep? That's an excellent question. They become alive. You know, they're just like fresh vegetables, so not that long. So you should sprout stuff and try to keep it fresh. Like, um, if you put stuff in the fridge, then it'll start to stabilize and it'll slow down its metabolic process, but it won't stop. It continues. That's why things wilt a little bit more slowly in the fridge, you know, because the, the, the atoms are just slowing down. So um, you should try to eat them as fresh as possible. But, um, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Can you give us some examples of what you would use those on, just like besides the sandwiches? Yes, I will. I will do that in a little bit. Okay. okay. Anything else right now? Okay. If you have a thought percolating that hasn't crystallized yet, just write it down and, and email me or ask in a minute. Okay. Now we're going to talk about... Um, so has the, uh, the garbanzo beans, the chickpeas, and the sunflowers, is that... It's okay. Is that they've gone around. Everybody's seen them. 
Okay, so the sunflower seed, I think everybody knows what it looks like. It's a big wide thing with a little point. So you start to sprout it, maybe you start to see this point grow longer. This is the beginning of a root. Maybe you start to see these things separate. These are beginning of, of leaves, right? You keep going and then it becomes this. This is a sprouted sunflower micro lettuce. Those leaves have separated. They've become green because they've gone in the sun and started to make chlorophyll. So this right here, one little sunflower seed, he's got this shell on it still, has become this, <laughs> this incredible little piece of lettuce, pretty much, you know? That's, that's a good deal. It's cheap, it's really easy to do, and it's a lot of energy. So now we're gonna talk about my very favorite sprout which is or my favorite seed, which is the flax seed. Flax is absolutely incredible for four reasons that I, that I figured out how to uh, explain here. And it just so happens that those reasons spell F-L-A-X. Very easy to remember. So F, this is for fiber. Flax is one of the best sources of fiber. You can only get fiber from plants. You can't get it from, from animal sources. What it is, is the cell wall of plants. It's indigestible, and it goes through our digestive system, kind of scraping out the inside, you know, brushing everything clean. It also exercises and tones our digestive organs, stimulates peristalsis, and it keeps everything working really well, you know? a strong digestive system, that's where we get our nutrients from. So if there's a lot of impacted stuff, the nutrients can't get through on the inside of the intestines and the colon, then we're not going to be able to extract those nutrients. If the digestive system isn't working well, if it's weak, if it's sickly, if it's blah, it's not going to be taking the nutrients out of the food. It's taking them into our bloodstream and sending them to our cells so that we can use them to think of Halloween costumes, right? So fiber is really important for being able to get the rest of the nutrients out of our food, for staying healthy, for preventing um, cancers and heart disease and things like that. There's two kinds of fibers. There's the one that I'm talking about. It's insoluble, doesn't break down. This is the, the cell wall of, uh, of plants and the shells of seeds, right? There's also insoluble, which is... I'm sorry, that was insoluble. There's also soluble, which is what breaks down. So I've got some flax here that I'm going to pass around. This is dry. And then I've got some flax that is sprouted. So you can see it's kind of slippery. It's a little bit goopy. This is the, the soluble fiber that started to come out. So take a look at those two, please, and pass them around. And this is great because it, it makes, uh, it adds like a, a slippery coating to our, you know, to our digestive waste, and it uh, just makes everything work better, okay? L is lignans. Lignans are antioxidants. Does anybody know what an antioxidant is? Antioxidants, anti oxygen. When things oxidize in our system, they're breaking down the, the, the chemical bonds and they're turning into free radicals. These nasty things that are going around our, our systems causing problems. Like cancer is one. Lignans are a powerful antioxidant. Flax is the best source of lignans that exist. Okay? A. Uh, these are acids, comma, essential fatty. I had to put it that way for it to fit in the flax thing. I hope you forgive me. Okay. Has anybody ever heard of an essential fatty acid? No? You guys never heard of an essential fatty acid? Yeah? A couple times, maybe? You know, does anybody know what they do in the body? Well, a clue is this right here. Fat. They are super high quality sources of fat. We need fat in our bodies for a lot of different things. One is creating uh, the brain when we're developing. Without the presence of good fats, kids are not gonna have proper mental functioning, memory, mental clarity, and that affects us as adults as well. 
high quality fats is high quality thoughts, high quality memory. Okay? It's also important for immune system functioning, healthy skin, hair, nails, and all sorts of things. And flax are one of the highest sources of omega-3 essential fatty acids in the vegetable kingdom. They're actually the second highest. There's also chia, but because of the X reason, which I'll get to in a minute, I recommend flax. A lot of people eat fish oils for their omega-3s. Have you guys heard about people doing this before? The, the omega-3s in fish oils, that actually comes from fish livers, Right? To me, that's a little bit of a strange thing to do, to eat a fish liver, because the liver is the thing in the body that filters the blood and removes toxins from the body, stores them in the liver. So if you're eating the liver of something, you're eating like everything that it tried to push away and was a little too toxic to even go into the bloodstream to release. It's like this this nasty warehouse of toxins in the system, right? Not only that, but the... um, the, the fish that are in the ocean, I mean, they're, they're constantly surrounded by heavy metals, toxins, pesticides, floating piles of garbage that are miles. I mean, there's one that's the size of Texas in the Pacific Ocean. So we can do all this stuff and get all this you know, stuff from the, the fish livers, or we can just eat flax and get a much better source of it. Okay. Another reason that omega-3s are important is because we have to have a balance of the omega fatty acids in our lives. Omega-3 isn't the only one. There's also 6. There's also 9. 9 we don't really need that much of, and it's really easy to get. 6 is also really easy to get. In fact, a little too easy to get. And we have a lot more than we need to in our diets. The ratio between omega-3s and omega-6s should be about 1 omega-3 to about four to six omega-6s. But what happens in our modern diet is because so many foods are so rich in omega-6s is that it's more like one to 20, one to 40, one to 50, and this is a problem. If we eat too many omega-6s, they don't get balanced by the omega-3s, they turn toxic in our systems, and our liver has to deal with them. Now, I grew up a pretty sick little kid, took a lot of pharmaceuticals and a lot of things like that, and so my liver doesn't really work that well. So if I eat foods that are really high in omega-6s, olive oil, zucchini, almonds, peanuts, um, avocado, um, and things like that, and I don't have enough omega-3s, I will instantly start to break out like crazy because my liver can't deal with them, so then it'll go right to my other organ of of elimination, my skin, and it'll just be like an instant obvious thing. So that's kind of like a clear message about why omega-3s are important, right? We might not know that we're getting too many omega-6s, but, you know, if we don't have the proper liver functioning, then we do know, and if we do have the proper liver functioning, it's only a matter of time until we don't anymore, okay? So that's omega-6s. Now, the... um, the X part. This is because flax, the uh, projector just turned on. Oh, sorry. It's okay. So the, the X part is that they are extremely cheap. A pound of organic flax is like two bucks, two fifty. And of all these benefits that we've talked about, it's like, it's such a good deal, right? They're also extremely easy to sprout. This whole high-tech, involved, 15-second process by rocket scientists, you don't even need to do that with flax. This one that I'm handing around, you take flax and you fill it up, and then you, you cover it with about three or four times as much water. And it'll sprout right underneath the water, It'll cover itself in this slippery coating that I talked about, and it'll just hang out there. Leave it out on the counter for 24 hours and stick it in the fridge. I'm so lazy that I keep it uncovered, and I stick a spoon just right in there so that I can take a tablespoon out and dump it in whatever I feel like dumping in. Okay? You can keep sprouting it if you want out in the fridge. It'll grow a little tail. Sometimes it can ferment a little bit. So I just sprout it for a day and stick it in there. Okay? That's flax, and that's why it's, that's why it's my favorite um, seed. I've brought in some food for you guys. One of the things is crackers, and it's flax 
and carrots is all that's in the crackers. So I wanted you really to be able to taste the flax, how nutty, how delicious, how good it is. And it was really challenging for me not to add more flavors because I'm a nut like that. But I just put the carrots and the flax in so that you can enjoy that. Does anybody have any questions about flax? Yes? If you were to put that shredded flax in the blender, would the friction of the blades break it down further, or would that be okay? It'd be okay. You actually want to break it down. You want to break open the seed mm -hmm. because the shell is so strong that if, it, if you take it with the, the shell hole, you're not going to break it up with, with your digestive system, you know, unless you're a ruminant and you can have rocks in your belly. Yes? Is there a big difference between, because I take flaxseed oil, is there a big difference between the seed and the oil? Well, you tell me. How much do you pay for flaxseed oil? Oh, yeah, 25 bucks for a bottle. 25 bucks for a bottle. This is like... This, yeah, okay, well, that's a good point. That is one difference. Another difference is we talked about the, um, the, the, with the flour, breaking open the seed, milling it. It's no longer a whole food. Now it's just, you know, powder. It's the same thing with flax oil. You squeeze the oil out, and then you have just the oil, which is incredibly good for you and so good for omega-3s, for digestion, for all sorts of things. But it's also very, very sensitive because it doesn't have the protection of this seed anymore. A little bit of oxygen, a little bit of light, and it'll start to break those omega-3 fatty acids down, which form chains. It'll break the bonds in between them so that they'll come apart and they won't have the beneficial effect in the system anymore as they will when they're, when they're fresh. So you get it from the fridge, I imagine, from the store where you buy it. Um, it's kept kind of cool, but until you open it, you don't refrigerate it. Okay. And when it's shipped, we're not really sure what the situation is. The truck is... like totally organic from... is close to the area that I'm living in. Uh-huh. That's awesome. So yeah. I mean, I, sometimes I have to get what I can get, but usually, I, you know... Jump yeah. Right around from Totally. Yeah, and that's fantastic. Um, it sounds like you're putting a lot of work into making sure it's fresh. There's another way to make sure it's fresh. Just get it whole yeah. and eat it. <laughs> it doesn't get more local than, than that, right? Well, that's why I was asking if there's any health benefits or anything like that. Yeah, well, and then the third thing is that, you know, the way things work, like we talk about, well, taking this nutrient out of that and getting this phytochemical or phytoestrogen or whatever from that. It's um, things... I'm not going to say that there's like an intelligence behind how things are put together. However, when you eat something that's fresh and raw and alive, oh, yeah. the enzymes that are in it are the exact proportion of the enzymes of the of the actual uh, other stuff in there that enzymes break down. It's like kind of amazing how everything sort of works out. So, when there's a whole food. There's a lot of things we don't know that are going on. So to take this thing out because we think we kind of understand it, to take this thing out and to separate them is going to take away from the synergistic effect of, of all the things being together. Now you were saying when you break from the seed to a sprout, you get the enzymes. It just, it, right. So when you get it from a seed to a whole plant, are you getting more benefits? Excellent question. Seed? This is great. This is why I wanted you guys to ask questions. The vegetable that grows from the seed, personally, you can see, just because I like raw vegetables, but is there different health benefits from eating seeds versus the whole plant? Okay, that's a great question. Yeah, there is. I mean, we're talking about eating the whole plant versus eating of, you know, just the, the thing that the plant grew, the vegetable or the fruit. You're trying to grow all the plants. Right. However, when you are sprouting a seed, when it starts to sprout is when it's the best. That's when the enzymes are the most activated. That's when the nutrients are the best. If it starts to grow a little bit, the kind of the rule of thumb is that the little tail that grows becomes as long as the seed itself. It starts to be like, okay, this is legit. This is for real. I'm going to become a plant now. No joke. So it starts to change to go towards being a plant. It gets a little bit more bitter. So it doesn't taste as good. It sometimes like changes some of the chemical components around so that it's going more towards plant phase and less towards 
dinner phase, okay? So you just want to sprout things a little bit. If you want to grow things, like these, for example, you know, there's things that you can grow in, oh, I should pass this around. There's things you can grow into lettuces. This is kind of old. It's been in my fridge for a while. Sorry, it's not so bright and beautiful. But um, there's things you can grow, you know, grasses, like wheatgrass, etc. You can you can juice it. There's things you can grow into little, like, lettuces. Like any lettuce that you grow, take a seed, and you put it in a little dirt, and it'll grow into a baby lettuce, baby the ru- arugula, butter lettuce, whatever it is like that. But most things, like, like you know, nuts, seeds, grains, etc., most things, you just sprout them a little bit, and they're going to be at the best. They're going to be at the cheapest, the, the easiest, the quickest to do, you know. So it's not that each one of these seeds, when it's sprouted, has as much nutrients as an entire plant, you know. That's not going to be possible. But, like, minute for minute, dollar for dollar, this is the best investment. Okay? Great questions. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, let's see. I, um, I brought some food in for you guys. Like I said, this is the crackers made with flax and carrot. There's hummus, which is made with garbanzo beans, like those ones that you see in that little cup. And um, again, I, I have flavored this very minimally so that you guys could just really taste what was going on here. There's a little bit of lemon, a little bit of garlic, and a little bit of salt in there, that's it. And then the third thing is um, just some, some like salad dressing stuff. It's parsley and, and uh, uh, basil and tomato and, and olive oil, salt and pepper. And then I also ground up some flax and put it in there. It made it thicker and it also made it a lot healthier, obviously. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, I want you to grab a, a, line up, grab a chip from the thing. I'm going to take some hummus and put it on one side so that you can eat just the, just the cracker by itself and just taste that, right? And I'll put a little bit of the good stuff on the hummus so you can enjoy that. Okay? Good. So that's it. Come on up.